Section 1 of The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 1. The Elder Critic and the Young Enthusiast by Haywood Braun It was a child in Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tale who finally told the truth by crying out, He hasn't got anything on, as the king marched through the streets clad only in the magic cloth woven and cut by the swindling tailor. You may remember that everybody else kept silent, because the tailor had given out that the cloth was visible to all except such as were unworthy of their position in life. The child knew nothing of this, and anyway he didn't have any position in life, so he piped up and cried, he hasn't got anything on. And though he was but a child, others took up the cry, and finally even the king was convinced and ran to get his bathrobe. The tailor, as we remember the story, was executed. In course of time, that child grew up, and married, and died, leaving heirs behind him, and they in turn were not barren, so that today vast numbers of his descendants are in the world. Nearly all of them are critics of one sort or another, but mostly young critics. Like their great ancestor, they are all frank and shrill, and either valiant or foolhardy as you choose to look at it. Certainly, they seldom hesitate to rush in. No, there is no doubt at all that they are just a wee bit hasty, these descendants of the child. It is rather useful that every now and then one of them should point a finger of scorn at some falsely great figure in the arts and cry out his nakedness at top voice. But sometimes they make mistakes. It has happened not infrequently that worthy and respectable artists and authors in great costs Close-fitting sack suits and heavy woolen underwear have been greeted by some member of the clan with the traditional cry, he hasn't got anything on. This may be embarrassing as well as unfair. Ever since the child scored his sensational critical success so many years ago, all his sons have been eager to do likewise. They have inherited an extraordinary suspicion regarding the raiment of all great men, even when they are forced to admit that some particular king is actually clad in substantial achievement of one sort or another, they are still apt to carp about the fit and cut of his clothing. Almost always they maintain that he borrowed his shoes from someone else and that he cannot fill them. In regard to humbler citizens, they are apt to carry charity to great lengths. In addition to the incident recorded by Anderson, they cherish another legend about the child. According to the tradition, he wrote a will just before he died in which he said, Thank heaven I leave not a single adjective to any of my descendants. I have spent them all. The clan is notoriously extravagant. They live for all the world like Bedouins of the Sahara without thought of the possibility of a rainy day. Their gaudiest years come early in life. Middle age and beyond is apt to be tragic. Almost nothing in the experience of mankind is quite so heartrending as the spectacle of one of these young critics, grown gray, coming face to face in his declining years with a masterpiece. At such times, he is apt to be seized with a tremor and stricken dumb. Undoubtedly, he is tormented with the memory of all the adjectives which he flung away in his youth. They are gone beyond recall. He fumbles in his purse and finds nothing except small change worn smooth. The best he can do is fling out a highly creditable piece of work and go on his way. Still, he has had fun for his adjectives for all that. There is a compensating glow in the heart of the young critic when he remembers the day an obscure author came to him asking bread, though rather expecting a stone and he with a flourish reached down into the bread box and gave the poor man layer cake. After all, one of the young critics told me in justifying his mode of life, it may be just as tragic as you say to be caught late in life with a masterpiece in front of you 
and not a single adequate adjective left in your purse. Yes, I'll grant you that it's unfortunate, but there's still another contingency which I mean to avoid. Wouldn't it be a rotten sell to die with half your adjectives still unused? You know you can't take them with you to heaven. Of what possible use would they be up there? Even the bravest superlatives would seem pretty mean and petty in that land. I think of being blessed with milk and honey for the first time and try to express your gratitude and wonder with the best I ever tasted. No, sir. I'm going to be ready for the new eternal words by using up all the old ones before I die. Of course, it will be well before going any further to point out that, generally speaking, a young critic remains that way no matter what his age. In the field of music, for instance, nobody is younger than James Gibbons Hunker. After twenty or thirty years of musical criticism, a great many men have the entire field divided into so many cubbyholes. If a new piece of music appears which does not fit into any of these, it is promptly thrown away as worthless. There is much to be said for the value of traditions, though not by the writer of this particular article. He feels too keenly what seems to him the tyranny which tradition has held over the English theatre. Shakespeare almost ruined the stage for all the men who came after him by not only looming head and shoulders over everybody else who had ever lived, but by being too high even for the succeeding generations to shoot at. He spoiled the game of speculating as to when and how the great English drama would be written by writing it, not once, but dozens of times. There followed centuries well down into our own day, when every playwright who came along was required to climb up and over Shakespeare before anybody was willing to speak enthusiastically about him. Of course nobody did, and for years there wasn't any enthusiasm about playwrights. It was all reserved for actors who played in Shakespearean revivals. No dead American playwright begins to be as well known as Edwin Booth. This is a sad state of affairs. Actors belonging in the theater only at the special invitation of playwrights, and here is one capturing the entire enthusiasm of one branch of American criticism for a quarter of a century. Not only did the tradition of Shakespeare terrify English and American dramatists for hundreds of years, but it ensured a cool reception to the great dramatists of other lands when they were introduced to us in translation. William Winter, the foremost American dramatic critic of his day, upbraided Mansfield for playing Cyrano, and the actor replied humbly enough that he knew it was a potboiler, but he was merely trying to get a little money together in order to do another Shakespearean revival. And of course, Ibsen and Shaw drove Winter into perfect tirades of fury. James Gibbons Hunker was one of the young critics who brought the attention of America to Ibsen and to Shaw. It is true that he did not have the effrontery to point at Shakespeare and shout, He hasn't got anything on! But he did the next best thing and pretended not to see him. Fortunately for the American novel, there is nobody with whom the younger generation can be clubbed into submission, and yet a few small gods and petty tyrants have been established. These have not been individuals so much as theories of life. Political and moral considerations have entered into American literary criticism to an amazing extent. Today, a number of novelists are judged not so much on the basis of their style, but rather more on their apparent attitudes towards Soviet Russia. Not in the same course of three years has the same book been praised by, quote, the Liberator and the New York Times, the strongest set feeling against which the younger novelists have to contend is American pride and satisfaction in rural life. This does not mean that any great number of Americans want to live in rural communities, but a great many do, and in order to flatter and compensate these, an enormous literary bulwark has been built up to protect the conception that the home life in American small towns is the most perfect in all the world. It was hard to persuade the small town man of this because he was living the life, but after all, what were his own petty misgivings against the voice of the Saturday Evening Post and the American Magazine? He was won over, although even today it may not be quite safe to offer him a job in New York or Chicago. The big cities were easy. 
urban folk felt that rural and small-town life as pictured in the magazines was not just what they wanted for themselves, not right away at any rate, but that it was the sort of thing which one ought to like as an ideal. Most New Yorkers will tell you that they hope some day or other to save up enough money to buy a farm and settle down upon it. The fact that they do nothing of the sort is not relevant. Of course, there have been sporadic attacks from time to time against the assumption of the perfection of pastoral life in America, but the big push has begun only within the last year. It has been terrific in its concentration, and the writers who have led the attack are Sinclair Lewis with Main Street, Zona Gale with Miss Lulu Bett, Floyd Dell with Moon Calf, and Sherwood Anderson with Poor White. These have been the directors of action in the field. But back at headquarters is a man who has had more to do with seizing the offensive against Puritanism than any of them. Naturally, we mean H. L. Mencken. Most Americans who dislike Puritanism have been content to remain on the defensive, but not so with Mencken. When Prohibition was first advanced, he suggested no compromise, but called instead for more rum. His answer to the plea for a blue Sunday is an impassioned appeal for a purple one. In and out of season, he has been shouting, he hasn't got anything on, at every consciously respectable figure in American letters. Naturally, he has not played scrupulously fair, but he has been a fine fighter. Even though one agrees with few of his ideas about life or literature, he must applaud the effect he has had on American writers. He has brought controversy and bitterness into literature and made it exciting and worthwhile. Only out of the vigorous clash of opinion can the great American novel come, or even the pretty good American novel. William Allen White was praising Main Street the other day, and at length he remarked, Of course I'm on the other side of the street myself, but that's just the reason why I like this book. It gives us fellows something to answer. End of section one. Section two of The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 2. Hiker at Midnight, by Carl Sandburg. Memories, you can flick me and sting me. Memories, you can hold me even and smooth. A circle of pearl mist horizons is not a woman to be waked up to and kissed, nor a child to be taken and held for a good night nor any old coffee-drinking pal to be smiled at in the eyes and left with a grip and a handshake. Pearl memories in the mist circling the horizon flick me, sting me, hold me even and smooth. End of section two. Section three of the Bookman by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are done in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Laszlo Beauregard. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 3. The World's Most Curious Books, by Walter Hart Blumenthal. Blindfold a confirmed librarian or bookworm, and he will tell you a surprising deal about a book merely by the heft and feel of it, not just a matter of weight or bulk or texture, the arcana of the initiated plumb deeper. The master book-knower, a Putnam, Windsor or Paul Tates, a Garnet, Pollard or Goss, can almost appraise a tome in the dark and tell you of its low degree and doubtless dross, or caress an elite duodecimo and call it more than a treasure. Indeed, he will frequently be able to tell the approximate decade of its publication by touch, smell, the crackle of its leaves, and the characteristics of its very edges. This talent is as esoteric as Hindu levitation, 
and certainly more dependable than professional weather forecasting. Aside from a person's apparel, his face, figure, bearing, gait, and other outward tokens reveal much of the man within. To the keen observer the hands alone are often a confession or a credential. So the chronic reader comes to know and judge books by a sort of trained intuition before he has glanced at the title page. The outward signs of a ribbed back or a silk headband bespeak quality as readily as do immaculate and tapering fingers. Somewhere there is a tawny volume bound in Bengal tiger, with a white feline fang protruding from each corner. It came from a noted French collection of fantastic bindings dispersed at auction in 1874. There were books in the library in the skins of crocodile, mole, seal, civet, lizard, and rattlesnake. There were volumes bound in Canadian black wolf, otter, and white bear. There were specimens in featherwork and in tortoiseshell inlaid with mother of pearl and silver. Strangest of all was an angling book bound in the shellacked scaly mail of a soul. General Sir George Napier had a work clothed in a piece of Charles I's silk waistcoat. It was a life of the celebrated dwarf Geoffrey Hudson, who measured 18 inches, fought a duel with a turkey cock, and at a royal banquet was brought to a table in a make-believe pie. More than once books have been bound in human skin. A Russian poet is said to have presented to the lady of his affections a collection of his sonnets bound in his own integument. The astronomer Flammarion, having admired the exquisite skin of a beautiful lady of title whom he met at a reception, she bequeathed it to him. When she died, he received a square of tissue and, in accordance with the instructions accompanying the legacy, had a copy of his own work, Ciel et Terre, bound therein. There is one erratic book collector whose every ascension is uniformly rebound in red Morocco before being put on his shelves. This was once commonly done by the nobility, whose armorial bearings were emblazoned on their books as on their coaches. Each of the three daughters of Louis XV had her own library. Madame Adelaide had all her books bound in maroon Morocco. Madame Sophie's were in Citron. Madame Victoire preferred Nile Green. An extraordinary volume which long belonged to the family of the Prince of Ligné is by some esteemed the most curious book in the world because it is neither written nor printed. The letters of the text are cut out line by line and page by page from the vellum folio. Being interleaved with tinted paper, it is easily read. The above volume is perhaps outdone in strangeness by a wordless book, which except for the title page contains not one syllable. It was devised by a person of strong religious bent who thought to convey an allegory in the color scheme of its leaves, of which two are black, two crimson, two white, and two gold. The black symbolizes the unregenerate heart of man, the crimson, the divine redemption, the white, the purity of the soul washed in the blood of the lamb, the gold, the felicity of eternal beatitude. Wilkes's Essay on Women, 1772, is printed throughout in red ink. The Book of Four Colors, by one Carasicoli, was issued at Paris in 1767 in gamboge, ultramarine, sepia, and vermilion inks. To test the legibility of colored paper and ink, the mathematical tables devised by Babbage were printed in 21 volumes at London in 1831. Only one copy of this truly unique work was made. 150 tints of paper were used and 10 hues of ink. The last volume contains metallic printing in gold, silver, and bronze on vellum and colored papers. A temperamental author, Monsieur de Rochat, contended that paper and ink as well as type should be in harmony with the printed word. Thus a love poem should appear in pale ink on rose-colored paper to convey the delicacy of its impress to the reader. When Queen Elizabeth was a plump princess, the vogue of embroidered book covers was in its heyday. Prince Elizabeth was adept in this as in other handiwork. She plied her needle with a fine artistry. Two specimens of her book embroidery are treasured in the British Museum. The custom of chaining books was once common throughout Europe. When there was a row of such books, each chain was fastened to a book by a staple and had a ring at the other end which permitted it to slide on a rod beneath the shelf and to be lifted to an adjacent lectern. The arrangement was like the rings on a curtain pole. The volumes were usually bulky 
and the attached chains about a yard long. The precaution prevented theft, but not mutilation. In those days the books were not for the populace, but were precious possessions of the church and nobility. Even with the spread of enlightenment and printing, most of these chained libraries and isolated tomes remained in duress. It required a smithy to release them, as it had to put them in jeeves. At Oxford University the library was fettered for three centuries, and the dons were prone willfully to tangle the chains. To this day, shackled books are met with here and there abroad. The array in Hereford Cathedral, England, is doubtless one of the most extensive, numbering 1,500 volumes. Even the library catalogue is riveted to its stand. Occasional ascensions are chained as of yore. The extra illustrations of books by the insertion of prints pertaining to the text was a craze comparable only with the tulipomania in Holland when fabulous sums were paid for rare bulbs. James Granger, whose hobby was print collecting, in 1769 published a biographical history of England, in which blank leaves were interspersed for filling in additional illustrations. This gave rise to Grangerizing, or searching for portraits of celebrities mentioned in the text and of scenes described, and inserting these in the volume. It is not generally known that the Chinese invented the encyclopedia. In 1408, the colossal Tung Lo Ta Tien, or Great Encyclopedia of Yung Lo, was completed. At the command of this emperor, three commissioners, with five directors, twenty supervisors, and a staff of 2,141 assistants, labored for five years compiling it. In magnitude, it was the greatest literary undertaking the world has known. It contained 917,480 pages and 366,992,000 characters. Of the books which are remarkable for oddity by reason of their contents rather than their appearance, that written by Timothy Dexter outdoes most. This screed, a pickle for the knowing ones or plain truths in a homespun dress, is without an iota of punctuation, though capitals are sprinkled with a fine frenzy. A second edition of this masterpiece has a page consisting of line after line of commas, semicolons, colons, and interrogation points for the convenience of those finicky readers who wish to pepper and salt the text to their liking. The author confides that he speaks with the voice of the people and can't help it. Small books have always been much sought. Monsieur Salomon of Paris was the most noted collector who has specialized in these specimens of the Lilliputian press. He acquired more than 200. One famous small book is the English Bijou Almanac for 1837, issued as a souvenir of Queen Victoria's ascension to the throne. It is three-quarters of an inch tall, one-half inch wide, and one-eighth inch thick. It has 37 pages. The Bijou Almanac is engraved, however, not printed from type. It is therefore eclipsed by that other diminutive volume, the Mite, which is one-eighth inch wider. The Mite was for a time deemed the smallest book ever printed from movable type. The difficulty of making and handling a font of type such as this may be judged when it is said that 4,000 eyes weigh one pound. The little-known Alarm Almanac, which appeared in Paris in 1781, is also from type and measures about three-quarters by nine-sixteenths of an inch, being one-sixteenth narrower than the mite. Monsieur Salomon thought he had the smallest book in the world. It was a Dutch work printed in 1674, containing 49 pages one-fourth the size of a postage stamp, and called Blumhof je Dur, or The Court of Flowers. But he erred, for there is a tome of 208 pages, each page with nine lines and about 100 letters, which is nine and one-half millimeters by six, 25.4 millimeters making an inch. This book of slightly over one-third of an inch by a shade less than one-fourth was printed by Salmin in 1897, and contains a hitherto unpublished letter of Galileo to Madame Christine of Lorraine. The text is in Italian. Savants know of several Greek compositions in which one letter of the alphabet is omitted throughout. There is a small Latin prose work by Fulgentius with as many chapters as there are letters in the alphabet. The first chapter is without an A, the second without a B, and so on. There are five Spanish stories by Lope de Vega, each omitting one vowel. Then there is a medieval Latin tract by one Hugbald in which every word begins with a C. Were these collected in one volume, it would assuredly make one of the most curious of books. One private collector of Bibles has more than 2,000 in various editions and tongues. 
in the British Museum are upwards of 16,000 copies of the scriptures or parts thereof. These represent over 2,700 editions in 83 languages. There were 57 distinct American Indian idioms north of Mexico, but Eliot's Bible of the Massachusetts tongue was for two centuries the only native translation. It was the first Bible printed in America. Did you ever possess an abecedarium? This Latin-sounding term merely denotes an ABC primer. Before the boon of school books, children learned the alphabet from horn books. These are not books in any ordinary sense, any more than the terracotta tablets of the ancient Assyrians. The abecedaria known as horn books resembled Milady's hand mirror, except that the handle was usually perforated so that it could be strung to the youngster's girdle. Most horn books bore the alphabet, numerals, and the Lord's Prayer on a card which slid into grooves or was tacked to the blade. This was covered with a sheet of transparent horn, like mica. Horn books were usually of wood or bone, but ivory or silver filigree specimens were used among the gentry. Even these, however, fade in charm beside the gingerbread horn books of which it is written, and that the child may learn the better, as he can name, he eats the letter. It remains only to mention bottle books, which are as rare as fish that climb trees. These curiosities were made in southern France about a century ago, and were held in great esteem by judges, advocates, and the learned gentry generally. The legal profession was given to carrying its authorities back and forth under its austere arm. Hence these relieu bottiers, which were made of lustrous decorated dark blue faience, in appearance not unlike to a Levant. The contents were wholly liquid, or partly literary, with a fortifying compartment. Then the bibulous bibliophile took a nip for his constitution. Now the constitution nips the bibulous bibliophile. End of section 3「Section 4 of The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 4. The Curious Case of Kennel Digby, by Christopher Morley. Being the first of a series of literary detective adventures we had been dining together at the hotel ansonia and as we walked up the shining breezy channel of broadway my friend doug dulcet the well-known poet and literary agent vigorously expounded a theorem which i afterward had occasion to remember there is every reason he cried why a poet should be the best of detectives my boy there is a rhyme in events as well as in words when you see two separate and apparently unconnected happenings that seem as one might say to rhyme together you begin to suspect one author behind them both it is the function of the poet to have a quick and tender apprehension of similarities the root of poetry is nothing else than describing things as being like other apparently quite different things the lady who compared herself to a bird in a gilded cage was chaffed for her opulent and spendthrift imagination, but in that lively simile she showed an understanding of the poetic principle. Look here, what is the commonest phrase of the detectives? To put two and two together. What else, I ask you, is the poet doing all the time but putting two and two together? Two rhymes, and then two rhymes more, and making a quatrain. He swung his stick, puffed strongly at his cigar, and amorously surveyed the deep blue of the night against which the huge blocks of apartment houses spread their random patterns of lighted windows between these granite cliffs flowed a racing stream of bright motors like the rapids of a river of light hurrying downward to the whirlpool of times square either for a poet or for a detective he said gaily this seems to me the ideal region i tell you I walk about here suspecting the most glorious crimes. When I see the number of banana splits that are consumed in these glittering drug stores, I feel sure that somewhere in the purple silences of the night, hideous consequences must follow. Those who feed so violently on that brutalizing mixture of banana, chocolate ice cream, 
cherry syrup and whipped marshmallow must certainly be gruesome at heart i look out of my window late at night toward the scattered lights of that vast pile of apartments always thinking to see them blaze some great golden symbol or letter into the darkness some terrible or obscene code that means death and terror your analogy seems to have some sense i said certainly the minor poet like the lawbreaker loves to linger about the scene of his rhyme or crime you are an amateur of puns he replied then let me tell you the motto i have coined to express the spirit of this little white way ein feist bourgeois ist unser gott this is the proud kingdom of the triumphant middle class it is a perilous country for a poet if he were found out he would be martyred at the nearest subway station but how i love it see how the quiet side streets cut across highways so richly contrasting west end avenue leafy expensive and genteel broadway so gloriously cruel and artificial amsterdam avenue so honestly and poignantly real my club is the hartford lunchroom where they call an omelette an omulet and where the mystic word combo resounds through the hatchway to the fat man in the kitchen my church is the st agnes branch of the public library over on amsterdam avenue in those cool quiet rooms when i watch the pensive readers i have a sense of treading near an artery of fine human idealism in all this various neighborhood i have a cheerful conviction that almost anything might happen in the late afternoon when the crosswise streets end on a glimpse of the jersey bluffs that glow like smoky blue opals and smell like rotten apples i feel myself on the very door rail of the most stunning outrages we both laughed and turned off on seventy seventh street to the small apartment house where dulcet had a comfortable suite of two rooms and bath in his book-lined sitting-room we lit our pipes and sat down for a gossip we had been talking at dinner of the extraordinary number of grievous deaths of well-known authors that had happened that year as it is almost unnecessary to remind you there was dunraven bleak the humorous essayist who was bound stark in both senses in his bathtub and cynthia carboy the famous writer of bedtime stories who fell down the elevator shaft in the case of mrs carboy the police were distracted because her body was found at the top of the building and the detective bureau insisted that in some unexplainable manner she must have fallen up the shaft but as dulcet pointed out at the time of the author's league inquiry the body might have been carried upstairs after the accident then there was andrew battle the psychological novelist whose end was peculiarly atrocious and miserable because it seemed that he had contracted tetanus from handling a typewriter ribbon that showed signs of having been poisoned frank lebanon the brilliant short story writer was stabbed in the fullness of his powers and there were others whom i do not recall at the moment mr dulcet had suffered severely by these sad occurrences for a number of these authors were his clients and the loss of the commissions on the sale of their works was a serious item the secret of these tragedies had never been discovered and there had been something of a panic among members of the authors league the rumor of a pogrom among best-selling writers was tactfully hushed what is your friend kenelm digby writing nowadays i asked as i looked along dulcet's shelves digby the brilliant novelist was probably dulcet's most distinguished client an eccentric fellow who in spite of his excellent royalties lived a solitary and modest existence in a boarding-house somewhere in that part of the west side outside his own circle of intimates dulcet was almost the only man whom digby saw much of and many of us who admired the novelist's work had our only knowledge of his person from hearing the agent talk of him by george i'm glad you reminded me said dulcet why he has just finished a story and he telephoned me this afternoon asking me to stop over at his house this evening to get the manuscript
he never has any dealings with the editors on his own hook wants me to attend to all his business arrangements for him i said i'd run over there about ten o'clock that last book of his was a great piece of work i said i've been following his stuff for over ten years and he looks to me about the most promising fellow we've got he has something of the fairy touch it seems to me yes he's the real thing said dulcet blowing a blue cloud of his cartesian mixture i only wish he were not quite so eccentric he lives like a hermit crab over in a lodging-house near the park even i who know him as well as most people never feel like intruding on him except when he asks me to i can't help thinking it would be good for him to get out more and see something of other men in his line of work i tried to get him to join the snails but he says that amsterdam avenue is his only amusement and central park seems to be his country club i wonder if you've noticed that in his tales whenever he wants to describe a bit of country he takes it right out of the park i sometimes suspect that's the only scenery he knows he has attained a very unusual status among writers i said in my rambles around among bookshops i have noticed that his first editions bring quite a good price it's very seldom that a writer at any rate an american gets collected during his lifetime did you ever see any of his manuscript asked dulcet and on my shaking my head he took out a thick packet of foolscap from a cabinet this is the original of girlhood he explained digby gave it to me it'll be worth a lot some day i looked with interest at the neatly written sheets thickly covered with a small beautiful and rather crabbed penmanship worth a lot i exclaimed well i should say so why the other day i was browsing round in a bookshop and found a lot of his first editions marked at fifteen dollars each it struck me as a very high price for i know i have seen them listed for three or four dollars in catalogues exorbitantly high dulcet said i'm afraid your bookseller is profiteering i admire digby as much as anyone but that is an artificial price the first aren't rare enough to warrant any such price as that still i'm glad to know about it as it's a sign of growing recognition i remember the time when it was all i could do to get any editors to look at his things i'll have to tell him about that it will please him mightily we sat for a while chatting about this and that and then dulcet got up and put on his hat look here old man he said you squat here and be comfortable while i run round to digby it won't take me more than a few minutes he lives on eighty-second street i'll be back right speedily and we can go on with our talk i heard him go down in the elevator and then i relit my pipe and picked out a book from one of his shelves i remember that it was brillat severance amusing gastronomy as a fine art i smiled at finding this in dulcet's library for i knew that the agent rather prided himself on being something of a gourmet and i was reading the essay of the jovial french epicure with a good deal of relish when the telephone rang i went to it with that slight feeling of embarrassment one always has in answering someone else's phone to my surprise it was dulcet's voice hello he said that's you ben listen i want you to come round to digby's right away and he gave the address thinking he had arranged a chance for me to meet digby i had long wanted to do so i felt hesitant about intruding but he repeated his message rather sharply please come at once he said it's important again he gave the straight number made me promise to come immediately and rang off it was nearly half past ten and the streets were fairly quiet as i walked briskly along the house was one of a row of old cocoa-colored stone dwellings and evidently someone was watching for me for while i was trying to read the numbers a door opened and from a dark hall an arm beckoned to me i went up the tall steps and a stout woman who seemed to be in some agitation whispered my name interrogatively is this mr toronto she murmured yes i said puzzled third floor front she said and i creaked quietly up the stairs i tapped at the front room on the top floor and dulcet opened thank goodness you're here ben he said something has happened it was a large comfortable room 
crowded with books on three walls furnished with easy chairs and a couch in one corner a brilliant blaze of light from several bulbs under a frosted hood poured upon a reading table in the middle of the room sitting at this table in a windsor chair slumped down into the seat was a short stout man whose head lolled sideways over his chest he was wearing a tweed suit and a soft shirt and looked as though he had fallen asleep at his work in front of him were some books and a can of tobacco i recognized him of course from the photographs i had often seen it was digby i looked at dulcet aghast but as always at such moments what was uppermost in my mind was something trivial and irrelevant i had an intense desire to open a window the air in that room was thick and foggy a sort of close strangling frost of venomously strong tobacco and furnace gas after the clear elixir of the wintry night it was loathsome it was the typical smell that hangs about the rooms of literary bachelors who work all day long in a room without ever thinking of airing it yes he said he's dead pretty awful isn't it i found him like this when i got here no sign of injury so far as i can see there was something profoundly dreadful in this first sight as mere sagging clay of the brilliant and powerful writer whose books i had so long admired and whom i had thought of as one of the strong and fortunate few who shape human perplexities to their own ends i looked down at him with a miserable blackness in my spirit and laid a hand on dulcet's shoulder in sympathy i've sent for a doctor he said before he comes i want to get all the information i can from the landlady i wanted to have you here as a witness i haven't touched anything the woman had followed me upstairs and stood crying quietly in the doorway come in mrs barlow said dulcet now please tell us everything you can about where mr digby went this evening and anything that has happened mrs barlow who seemed to be a good-hearted simple-minded creature snuffled wretchedly oh dear oh dear she said he was such a nice gentleman too let me see he went out about seven i suppose for his supper but he was always irregular about his meals you never could tell sometimes he would eat in the middle of the afternoon and sometimes not till late at night i always would urge him that he would die of indigestion but he was so kind-hearted you don't know where he went said dulcet perhaps he went round to the laundry she said for he had a parcel with him which i took to be his laundry because he usually took it out on monday evenings because by that time the clean shirt he put on on sunday was ready to go to the wash i hate to think that in all the years he lived in this house his laundry was the only thing we ever had a difference about because i used to have it done in the house for him but he said my washwoman tore the buttons off his shirts or collars or something so a little while ago he started taking his things out to be done but i don't know where because he used to call for them himself you haven't any idea where he used to eat insisted dulcet oh no sir he liked to go to different places you know yourself how he was always a bit queer and concentric and he never talked much about where he went but always so nice and considerate oh he was a fine gentleman mrs barlow plainly much grieved wept anew please try to tell us everything you can think of said dulcet gently what time did he come in and did you notice anything unusual nothing out of the way that i can think of but when i was down in the basement most of the evening for i let my maid go to the movies and i had a deal to do i suppose he went along amsterdam avenue he was always strolling up and down amsterdam or columbus poor man getting ideas for his literature i guess he came back about nine o'clock i should say because i heard the door about then just a few minutes before he came in there was a man came to the door with a tin of tobacco for him which he said mr digby had ordered sent around and i took it up and put it on his table there it is now poor man carter's mixture mrs barlow pointed to the tin of cartesian mixture that stood on the table evidently it had only just been opened for it was practically full yes said dulcet here's his pipe lying on the floor under his chair he picked up the briar and glanced at it 
only just begun to smoke it for the tobacco is only a little burned he must have been smoking when he there wasn't anything else you could think of the woman dried her eyes with her apron there was just one other thing i noticed but i suppose it's silly but i took note of it special because i thought i had heard it before lately while he was out and a little before the man brought the tin of tobacco i heard a sharp tapping out on the street in front of the house i noticed it special because i thought at first it was someone rapping on the door and i wondered if the bell was out of order again but when i went i couldn't see anyone but i wondered about it because i heard it two or three times a sharp kind of tapping it sounded some way like hitting on a stone with a stick of some sort dulcet and i looked at each other rather blankly and after that she went on i didn't think about anything one way or another until you came in and i told you to go right up there was a clear peal from the front door bell that's the doctor said dulcet and mrs barlow hurried downstairs i have never seen anyone so brisk and matter-of-fact as that physician and after his arrival the affair seemed to pass out of dulcet's hands into the painful official machinery that takes charge in such events dulcet acting as the dead writer's literary representative went into the adjoining room which was digby's study to look over the papers in the desk for any manuscripts that he ought to take care of he wrote out a list of friends and relatives for me to send telegrams to and i went out to attend to this i don't know how they get wind of these affairs but the reporters were already beginning to arrive when i left the next day and for several days afterward the papers all carried long stories about poor digby's brilliant career then the literary weeklies took it up at the libraries and bookshops everyone was asking for his books and i have never seen a more depressing illustration of the familiar fact that a writer's real fame never comes until it is too late to do him any good editors and people who had hardly been aware of digby's genius while he was alive now praised him fluently speaking of him as america's most honest realist and all that sort of thing moving picture people began inquiring about the film rights of his novels some of the sensational newspapers tried to play up his death as a mystery story but the physicians asserted heart failure as the cause and this aspect of the matter soon subsided except at the funeral which was attended by a great many literary people i did not see dulcet for some days i gathered from what i read in the news that digby's will had appointed him executor of his literary property and i knew that he must have much to attend to but one afternoon the telephone rang and dulcet asked me if i could knock off work and come round to see him as i was living uptown at the time it only took me a few minutes to go round to his apartment i found him smoking a pipe as usual and looking pale and fagged he welcomed me with his affectionate cordiality and i sat down to hear what was on his mind you must excuse me if i'm a little upset he said i've just had an interview with a ghoul a fellow came in to see me who had heard that i have a number of poor digby's books and manuscripts he wanted to buy them from me offered big prices for them he said that since digby's death all his first editions and so on have gone up enormously in value apparently he expected me to do trading over the dead body of a friend he smoked a while in silence and then said sorry not to have seen you sooner but to tell the truth i've had my hands full his brother who was the nearest kin couldn't come from ohio on account of serious illness and everything fell on me i had to pack up all his things and ship them all that sort of business but i've been wanting to talk to you about it because i'm convinced there was something queer about the whole affair i'm not satisfied with that heart failure verdict that's absurd there was nothing wrong with his heart that i ever heard of it's very unfortunate that for the first few days i was too occupied with urgent matters to be able to follow up the various angles of the affair but i've been turning it over in my mind and i've got some ideas i'd like to share with you you remember what i told you with unfortunate levity about the secret of detective work being ability to notice the unsuspected rhymes in, in events well 
there are one or two features of this affair that seem to me to rhyme together in a very sinister fashion wait a minute until i put on my other coat and we'll go out he went into his bedroom i had not liked to interrupt him but i was yearning for a smoke for leaving my rooms in a hurry i had forgotten to bring my pouch with me on his mantelpiece i saw a tin of tobacco and began to fill my pipe to my surprise just as i was taking out a match he darted out of the bedroom uttered an exclamation and snatched the briar from my hand sorry he said bluntly but you mustn't smoke that it's something very special he opened his penknife scraped out the weed i had put in the bowl and carefully put it back in the tin he took the tin and locked it in his desk try some of this he said handing his pouch i concluded that the tension of the past days had troubled his nerves this rudeness was so unlike him that i knew there must be some explanation but he offered none as we went down the elevator he said the question is can you make a rhyme out of tobacco and collar buttons no i said a little peevishly and i don't believe anyone could except edward lear well he continued that's what we've got to do and don't imagine that it's merely a nonsense rhyme any more than lear's were edward lear was as great as king lear in his own way he led me to eighty second street the december afternoon was already dark as we approached mrs barlow's house at the foot of her front steps he halted and turned to me is your pipe going he said no i said irritably it's out and i haven't any tobacco don't be surly old chap i'll give you some if you'll tell me what you do when your pipe goes out why you idiot i cried i do this and i knocked out the ashes by striking the bowl smartly against the palm of my hand ah he said but some people do this he bent down and wrapped his pipe against the stone ramp of the steps with a clear sharp hollow sound yes a good way to break a nice pipe i was remarking when the basement door of the house blew open and mrs barlow darted out into the sunken area just below the pavement level in the pale lemon-colored glare of a nearby street lamp we could see that she was strongly excited good gracious she panted is it mr dulcet oh sir you did give me a turn oh dear that was just the tapping sound i heard the night poor mr digby died what was it did you hear it like this said dulcet knocking his pipe again on the stone step that was it exactly she said what a fright to be sure was it only someone knocking his pipe like that oh dear it did bring back that horrid evening just as plain so much for the mysterious death rap said dulcet as we walked back toward amsterdam avenue i can't claim much ingenuity for that however you see the morning after digby's death i went round to mrs barrow's early before she had been out to sweep her pavement the first thing i noticed by the lowest step was a little dottle of tobacco such as falls from a half-smoked pipe when it is knocked out that seemed to me to make a perfect couplet with mrs barrow's tale of the tapping she had heard she heard it several times you remember in a short space of time that suggests to me someone standing on the street or walking up and down in a state of nervousness because he didn't smoke any of his pipes through when they were only half smoked he knocked them out in sheer impatience was he waiting for someone perhaps it was digby himself i suggested i don't think so he said because in the first place nervousness was the last thing i would associate with his temperament which was calm and collected in the extreme and also he always smoked brown-eyed blend and had done so for years that was the first thing that struck me as unusual the night we were there that tin of cartesian on the table he was a man of fixed habits why should he have made a change just that night i picked up the little wad of tobacco i found lying on the step and took it carefully home it's cartesian or i'm a dutchman so item one in our criminal rhyme scheme is find me a nervous man smoking cartesian it's a bit fanciful i objected of course it is he cried 
but crime is a fanciful thing ever let the fancy roam as keats said what the deuce is the line that follows suppose we stroll down amsterdam avenue and find a new place to have dinner poor old digby he said as we walked along admiring the lighted caves of the shop windows how he enjoyed all this you know there is a certain honest simplicity about amsterdam avenue's merchandising that is pleasant to contemplate after the shining sophistications of broadway in a broadway delicatessen window you'll see such horrid luxuries as jars of coxcombs and jelly whereas along here the grocery show candid and heartening signs of such as this coming back to the old times seventeen cents pound sugar amsterdam avenue shopkeepers speak with engaging directness about their traffic for instance there's a barber at the corner of eighty first street who embosses on his window the legend yes we do buster brown hair cutting that sort of thing is very humane and genuine that's why digby was so fond of it there's a laundry along here somewhere that i have often noticed it calls itself the fastidious laundry speaking of laundries i said what do you think of this we stopped and i pointed to a neatly lettered placard in a laundry window which had caught my eye it said notice to artists and authors we sew buttons on soft collars free of charge by jove i said there's a laundry that has the right idea i think i'll bring my i broke off when i saw my companion's face he was leaning forward toward the pane and his eyes were bright but curiously empty as though in some way the mechanism of sight had been reversed and he was looking inward rather than out that's very odd he said presently i've been up and down the street many times but i never noticed that sign before he turned and marched into the shop and i followed in the soft steamy air several girls were ironing shirts and a plump pink cheeked hebrew stood behind a counter wrapping up bundles i noticed your sign in the window said dulcet what do you charge for laundering soft collars five cents each but we mend them too and sew on the buttons that's a good idea said dulcet genially i wish i'd known that before i'd have brought my collars round to you how long have you been doing that i often go by here but i never saw the sign before only about a week the man replied let's see a week ago last monday i put that sign up you wouldn't believe how much new trade it has brought in i thought it would be a kind of a joke the man next door suggested it and i put it in to please him but most everybody wears soft collars nowadays and it seems good business the man next door said dulcet in a casual tone sure the cigar store is his name stork said dulcet reflectively stork why no basswood what do you mean stork i mean said dulcet slowly does he ever stand on one leg quit your kidding cried the laundryman annoyed i assure you i do not trifle said dulcet gravely i'll bring you in some collars to fix up for me much obliged we went out again and my companion stood for a moment in front of the laundry window looking thoughtfully at the sign while you ponder old son i said i'll run into mr stork basswoods and get some tobacco he seized my arm in a firm and painful clutch and whispered look at the corner the laundry was the second shop from the corner under the lamp post at the angle of the street i saw to my amazement a man standing balanced on one leg directly under the light he was partly in shadow and i could only see him in silhouette but the absurd profile of his one-legged attitude afflicted me with a renewed sense of absurdity and irritation dulcet i thought had evidently suffered some serious stroke in the region of his wits now he said softly can you see any rhyme between soft collars and standing on one leg as he spoke we both started for somewhere near us on the street there sounded a sharp tapping a ringing hollow wooden sound evidently it came from the one-legged man this was too much for my composure i broke away from dulcet and ran to the corner as i got there the one-legged creature put down a concealed limb and stood solidly on two feet in a state of normalcy 
as an eminent statesman would say i was confused and said angrily to the man here you mustn't stand like that on the public street you know on one leg it's setting a bad example to my amazement he made no retort whatever but turned and scuttled hastily down the avenue disappearing in the crowds that were doing their evening marketing my dear fellow said dulcet calmly coming up to me you shouldn't have done that you very nearly spoiled it all come on let's go in and get your tobacco basswoods proved to be one of those interesting combination tobacco stationery toy and bookshops which are so common on the upper west side i have often noticed that these places are by no means unfruitful as hunting ground for books because the dealers are wholly ignorant of literature and sometimes one may find on their shelves some forgotten volume that has been there for years and which they will gladly part with for a song a good many of these stores have tucked away at the back a shabby stock of circulating library volumes that have come down through many changes of proprietorship only the other day i saw in just such a place first editions of kenneth graham's the golden age and arthur Mathen's the three impostors which the storekeeper was delighted to sell for fifteen cents each a dark young man was behind the tobacco counter and from him i got a packet of my usual blend mr basswood in said dulcet just stepped out said the young man we lit our pipes and looked round the shop glancing at the magazines and the queer miscellany of books as it was approaching christmas time there was a profuse assortment of those dreadful little bibelots that go by the name of gift books among which were the usual copies of processional and vampire thoreau's friendship ballads of the chichapo bound in what the trade calls padded ooze i was particularly heartened to observe that one of those atrocities called as a man thinketh was described on the box for all such books come in little cardboard cases as being bound in antique yap this pleased me so much that i was about to call it to dulcet's attention when i saw that he was looking at me from the rear of the store with a spark in his eye i approached and found that he was staring at a doorway partly concealed by a pile of christmas toys and novelties over this door was a sign j basswood rare book department can we go in and look at the rare books said dulcet sure thing said the young man help yourself the boss will be back soon if you want to buy anything mr basswood was evidently a man of some literary discretion to our amazement we found in a dark little room lined with shelves a judicious assortment of modern books several hundred volumes and all first editions or autograph copies the prices were marked in cipher so we could not tell whether there were any bargains among them but i know that i saw several particularly rare and desirable things which i would have been glad to have good heavens i said to dulcet friend basswood is a real collector there isn't a thing here that isn't of prime value he was staring at a shelf in the corner and i went over to see what he had found upon my soul i cried look at the digbys not merely one copy of each but three or four this man must have specialized in digbys not only that said dulcet but he has three of the autogenesis of a novelist the first thing that digby wrote it was privately printed and afterwards suppressed it's devilish rare even i haven't got a copy i wish i knew what prices he asked for these things look at this i said perhaps this will tell us i picked up one of a pile of pamphlets that were lying in a large sheet of wrapping paper in a corner of the room it was evidently a new catalogue of mr basswood's rare books that had just come from the printer here we are i said turning over the leaves look at this special note fine collection of digbiana j basswood wishes to call particular attention to the digbiana listed below anticipating the growing interest in collector's items of this great writer's work j basswood has taken pains to gather a stock of first editions and presentation copies which is absolutely unique 
the prices of these items while high are a fair index of the appreciation in which this author's work is held among connoisseurs all our copies in good condition and their authenticity is guaranteed november fifteenth nineteen blank dulcet seized the catalogue and ran his eye down the pages girlhood first edition Bolton rifflin company nineteen o one one hundred dollars he read the nuisance of being loved first edition seventy five dollars the princess quarrelsome ninety dollars the anatomy of cheerfulness autograph copy a hundred and fifty dollars distemper acting copy signed by the author and richard mansfield two hundred dollars why he cried shrilly this is madness i am in touch with all the dealers in this sort of thing and i know the proper prices this man has multiplied them by ten he thrust the catalogue into his pocket and glared round at the musty shelves i suppose it's due to poor digby's death i said i saw that dulcet was overwrought and suggested that we go out and get some supper supper he said a good idea i know a place on broadway where we can get some guinea pigs he strode out of the store and i followed wondering what next he seized my arm and hurried me along seventy-ninth street to broadway to be concluded End of section four. Section five of the Bookman, March nineteen twenty one, by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 5. Child and Wind, by Lola Ridge. Wind tramping among the clouds that scatter like sheep. Wind blowing out the stars like lights in open windows. Wind doubling up your fists at the tall trees, and hailing fields by the grass. Keep away from the telegraph wires, with my kite in your hand. End of section 5 Section 6 of The Bookman, March 1921 by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by devora allen the bookman march 1921 by various section 6 murray hill sees mr chesterton by murray hill new york January 1921. Somewhat later in this article, I am going to present an interview, or something like that, with Gilbert K. Chesterton. At least, I hope I am going to present it. Yesterday, it looked as though I might have to get up my interview without having seen Mr. Chesterton, though today the situation appears somewhat brighter. Seeing Mr. Chesterton, on his visit over here at any rate, seems to be a complicated matter. As anything which gives some view of the workings of the Chestertonian machinery ought to be of interest to all who can lay claim to the happy state of mind of being Chestertonites, I'll begin by telling the proceedings so far in this affair. Then, as matters progress to supply me with more material, if they do progress, I'll continue. I one time wrote an article in which I told with what surprising ease I saw Mr. Chesterton several years ago in England. Without acquaintances in England, some sort of a fit of impudence seized me. I wrote Mr. Chesterton a letter, communicating to him the intelligence that I had arrived in London, that it was my belief that he was one of the noblest and most interesting monuments in England, and I asked him if he supposed that he could be viewed by me at some street corner, say at a time appointed as he rumbled past in his triumphal car. Mrs. Chesterton replied directly in a note that her husband wished to thank me for my letter 
and to say that he would be pleased if I cared to come down to spend an afternoon with him at Beaconsfield. Mr. Chesterton, I later recalled, had no means readily at hand of ascertaining whether or not I was an American pickpocket, but from the deference of his manner I was led to suspect that he vaguely supposed I was perhaps the owner of the New York Times or somebody like that. This escapade of my visit to Overroads, I suppose it was, that put into the head of the editor at the Bookman the notion that I was a person with ready access to Mr. Chesterton. So I was served with a hurry-up assignment to see him and to deliver an article about my seeing him for the March number of the magazine before that issue, then largely in the hands of the printers, got off the press. Thus my adventures, the termination of which are at present considerably up in the air, began. I at once wrote to Mr. Chesterton at the hotel where at the moment he was in Boston. At the same time I wrote to Lee Kedick, manager of the world's most celebrated lecturers, at his office in New York. I had picked up the impression that a lecture manager of this caliber owned outright the time of a visiting celebrity whom he promoted, and that you couldn't even telephone the celebrity without the manager's permission. I didn't know that you couldn't telephone him anyway, or that you couldn't telephone the manager either. Mr. Kedick very promptly replied that he would be very glad to do everything that he could to bring about the interview, or at least I received a very courteous letter to this effect, which bore a signature which I took to be that of Mr. Kedick. Mr. Chesterton was not to be back in New York until after a couple of days. On the day set for his return to town, I attempted to communicate with Mr. Kedick by telephone. I am, I fear, a bit slow at the etiquette of telephones, and I so far provoked a young woman at the other end of the wire as to cause her to demand rather sharply, "'Who are you?' This matter adjusted amicably, Mr. Kedick turned out to be so utterly remote from attainment that I am not altogether sure such a person exists. However, another gentleman responded cordially enough. Still, it seemed to me, upon reflection, that in a matter of this urgent nature I had been at fault in having failed to obtain more definiteness in the matter of an appointment. So I went around to the manager's office, very affably received, presented to a gentleman fetched for that purpose from another room, where he had been closeted with someone else, Mr. Whittacombe, this gentleman's name, introduced as Mr. Chesterton's secretary, a pronounced Englishman, in effect, said very politely, indeed, several times, that he was delighted. Mr. Chesterton, however, was going away tomorrow, would return two days hence, made Mr. Whittacombe very careful memorandum of my address. In due course of time, thought I'd better look up Mr. Whittacombe again. His memorandum might have got mislaid. Telephoned lecture bureau, satisfied young lady of honorable intentions, explained matters all over again to owner of agreeable masculine voice. Received assurance that Mr. Whittacombe would be reminded at once of pressing state of affairs. Disturbed by uneventful flight of time, I called in at lecture bureau once more. Learned that Mr. Whittacombe had not yet turned up. They, however, would try to get him on the wire at the Biltmore for me. Yes, he was there, but the fourth-floor desk of the hotel said he had just gone into Mr. Chesterton's room, and so, as apparently everyone ought to know, could not be communicated with just now. He would call up shortly. Lecture people suggested that I go round to the hotel. If Mr. Whittycombe called in the meantime, they'd tell him I was on my way over. Thought I recognized the gentleman stepping out of the elevator at the fourth floor. I did not know whether or not it was at all the thing to lay hold of an Englishman in so abrupt a fashion, but concluded this would have to be done. Mr. Whittycombe was all courtesy. The point, however, was that Mr. Chesterton had had an hour of it this morning, had had an hour of it. This afternoon he was getting off some work for London. Then tomorrow, of course, would be his lecture. My matter did seem to be urgent, but what could we do? Mr. Chesterton was a beautiful man. He had been so hospitable to the gentlemen of the press, but if we should go into him now he would say, Dear me, dear me. I readily saw, of course, that this would be an awful thing. Still, Mr. Whittycombe was somewhat inclined to think that we could do this. Suppose I should come to the Times Square Theatre the next afternoon, at about a quarter to five, call for him at the stage entrance. Yes, he thought we could arrange it that way. I could talk to Mr. Chesterton in the taxi on the way back to the hotel. Perhaps detain him for a few moments afterward. Mr. Whittycombe smiled very pleasantly indeed at the idea of so happy a conclusion of our difficulties. And I myself was rather taken by the notion of interviewing Mr. Chesterton in a cab. The fancy occurred to me that this was perhaps, after all, 
the most fitting place in the whole world in which to interview Mr. Chesterton. So everything seems to be all right. New Complications This is the following day. In the morning mail, a letter from Mrs. Chesterton, saying so sorry not to have answered my letter before, but it had been almost impossible to deal with the correspondence that had reached them since they arrived in America. Her husband asked her to say he would very much like to see me, and could I call at the hotel round about twelve o'clock on Sunday morning? No difficulty about meeting Mr. Chesterton and the kindness of that, but Sunday might be quite too late for the purpose of my article. So I'll go to the theatre anyway, and I'll certainly accept all Chesterton invitations. A colored dignitary in a uniform sumptuously befrogged with gold lace who commanded the portal directed me to the stage entrance. I passed into a dark and apparently deserted passage and paused to consider my next step. Before me was a tall, brightly lighted departure, and coming through this I caught the sound gently rising and falling of a rather dulcet voice. A slight pause in the flow of individual utterance, and directly following upon this a soft wave, as of the intimate mirth of an audience, wafted about what was evidently the auditorium beyond. Just then a figure duskily defined itself before me and addressed me in a gruff whisper. I was directed to proceed around the passage extending ahead, to room three. I should have passed behind a tall screen, I recognized later, but inadvertently I passed before it and suddenly found myself the target of thousands upon thousands of eyes, with the unmistakable back of Mr. Chesterton looming in the brilliance directly before me. Regaining the passage, I found a door labeled A3. Receiving no response to my knock, I opened it, and peered into a lighted cubbyhole about one-third of the size of a very small hall bedroom. The only object of any conspicuousness presented to me was a huge dark garment hanging from a hook in the wall. It seemed to be... Ah, yes, it was a voluminous overcoat with a queer cape attached. So, I was in the right shop, all right. I thought I ought to look around and try to find somebody. I wandered into what I suppose are the wings of the theatre. Anyway, I had an excellent view, from one side, of the stage, and of a portion of one gallery. The only person quite near me was a fireman, who paid no attention whatever to me, but continued to gaze out steadily at Mr. Chesterton with an expression of countenance which, as well as I could decipher it, registered fascinated incomprehension. I attempted to lean against what I supposed was a wall, but to my great fright the whole structure nearly tumbled over as I barely touched it. Perceiving a chair the other side of the fireman, I passed before him, sat down, and gave myself over to contemplation of the spectacle. My first impression, I think, was that Mr. Chesterton was speaking in so conversational a key that I should have expected to hear cries of louder coming from all over the house. But from the lighted expressions of the faces far away in the corner of the gallery visible to me, he was apparently being followed perfectly. I did not then know that at his first public appearance in New York he had referred to his lecturing voice as the original mouse that came from the mountain. Nor had I then seen Francis Hackett's comment upon it that it wasn't of course a bellow, neither was it a squeak. Mr. Hackett adds that it is the ordinary good lecture hall voice. I do not feel that this quite describes my own impression of it the other afternoon. Rather, perhaps, I should put the matter in this way. My recollection of the conversation I had with Mr. Chesterton in 1914 at Beaconsfield is that there was a much more ruddy quality to his voice then than the other day, and more, much more, in the turn of his talk a racy note of the burly world. Perhaps he feels that before a representative American audience, one should be altogether what used to be called genteel. At any rate, I certainly heard the other day the voice of a modest, very friendly, cultivated, nimble-minded gentleman, speaking with a nicety of precision more frequently observed among English people than among Americans. There was in it even a trace of a tone as though it were most at home within university walls. Though indeed, I am glad to say Mr. Chesterton did not abstain from erudite, amused, and amusing allusions to the society most at home in the pubs. And I cannot but suspect that perhaps he would have been found a shade more amusing than even he was if... but no matter. One gentleman who wrote a piece about his impressions of Mr. Chesterton's lectures here felt that the audience didn't have quite so much of a good time as the members of it had expected to have. I heard only a brief concluding portion of one lecture. 
The portion of the audience which came most closely before my observation were those seated at the well-filled press table, which stood directly between the speaker and me. These naive beings gave every evidence of getting, to speak temperately, their money's worth. Though Mr. Chesterton turned the pages of notes as he spoke, he could not be said to have read his lecture. On the other hand, it was clear that he did not appreciably depart from a carefully prepared disquisition. The tumbled mane which tops him off seemed more massive even than before. It did not, though, appear quite so tumbled. I think there had been an effort, since 1914, to brush it quite nicely. Certainly it is ever so much grayer. I think in my earlier article I said something like this. Mr. Chesterton has so remarkably red a face that his smallish moustache seems lightish in color against it. While Mr. Chesterton's face today could not be described as pale, it looks more like a face, and less like a glowing full moon. The moustache is darker against it, less bristling than before, more straggly. A couple of our recent commentators upon Mr. Chesterton have taken a fling at the matter of his not being so huge as, it seems to them, he has been made out to be. I remember that when I saw him before I was startled to find him more monstrous than even he had appeared in his pictures. He appears to take part a good deal in pageants in England, and recent photographs of him as Falstaff, or Tony Weller, or Mr. Pickwick, or somebody like that, have not altogether squared up with my recollection of him. True, he has not quite the bulk he had before, but it is a captious critic, I should say, who would not consider him sufficiently elephantine for all ordinary purposes. He was saying, much to the delight of the house, when I became one of the audience, that he would not regard this as the time or the occasion for him to comment upon the lid on liquor. A bit later in the course of his answer to the question he had propounded, shall we abolish the inevitable, he got an especially good hand when he remarked, People nowadays do not like statements having authority, but they will accept any statement without authority. He concluded his denunciation of the idea of fatalism with the declaration, Whatever man is, he is not in one sense a part of nature. He has committed crimes. Crimes, he repeated, with gusto in the use of the word, and performed heroisms which no animal ever tried to do. Let us hold ourselves free from the boundary of the material order of things, for so shall we have a chance in the future to do things far too historic for prophecy. I darted back toward room three, ran into Mr. Whittycombe, we wheeled, and saw the mountain approaching. Whereas before this off-stage place had been deserted, now the scene was populous, with the figures of agitated young women. Mr. Whittycombe, however, with much valiance, secured Mr. Chesterton. "'Yes, yes,' he said, and, remarkable remark, "'I had the pleasure of meeting you in England.' He glanced about rather nervously at the dancing figures seeking to obtain him, and led the way for me into the dressing-room. Mr. Whittycombe pulled the door to from without. "'I am far from being as large as Mr. Chesterton, but the two of us closeted in that compartment was an absurdity. Mr. Chesterton eclipsed a chair, and beamed upon me with an expression of cheerable-like brightness. Upon his arrival in New York, he had declared to the press that he would not write a book of his impressions of the United States. I asked him if, after being here a week or so, he had changed his mind as to this determination. Not definitely, he said, not definitely. But of course one could never tell what one might do. He might write a book about us, then? Yes, he might. Did he think it at all likely that he would take up residence over here? A very joyous smile. One's own country is best, he said. Rumors had several times been afloat that he had entered the Roman Catholic Church. Would he say whether there was any likelihood of his doing this? He was an Anglican Catholic, he replied. Not a Roman Catholic, yet. That was not to say that he might not be, if the Church of England should become more Protestant. What was his next book to be? Had he any project in mind of going to Turkey or Mexico or some such place? No. The only books he was working on at present were a new volume of short stories and a book, smiling again widely, on eugenics. He knew Mr. Lucas, of course? Yes, fine fellow. Did he know Frank Swinnerton? No. What was... But the door was popped open. Several persons were waiting for him, among them Mrs. Chesterton. I helped him into the cape coat. Stood behind the door so that when it was opened he could get out. "'You know Mr. Hill?' he said to Mrs. Chesterton. "'Thank you so much,' he said to me, and was whisked away. 
Sunday at the hotel. He was late in arriving. I thought it would be pleasanter to wait a bit out in front. Expected he would drive up soon in a taxi. Then I saw him coming round the corner, walking, rolling slowly from side to side like a great ship, Mrs. Chesterton with him, a little lady whose stature suggested the idea of a yacht, gracefully coursing alongside the huge craft. I wonder if, nowadays, when most writers seem to try to look like something else, Mr. Chesterton knows how overwhelmingly like a great literary figure he looks. When we were seated, I asked if he had any dope on his New Jerusalem book. He began to tell me how surprised he had been to find Jerusalem as it is, but the substance of this you may find in the book. He expressed sympathy with the idea of Zionism, remarked that he might become a Zionist if it could be accomplished in Zion. All that he could find to tell me about his New Jerusalem was that it had been written on the spot. Seemed very disinclined to talk about his own books, said his feeling in general about each one of them was that he hoped something would happen to it before anybody saw it. His surprise at Jerusalem suggested to me the question, had he been surprised at the United States, what he had seen of it. But he dodged giving any view of us. His only comment was on the multitudinous wooden houses. Had he met many American authors? The one most recently met, a day or so ago in Northampton, though he had met him before in England, was a gentleman he liked very much. He was so thin, Mr. Chesterton thought the two of them should go around together. His name? Gerald Stanley Lee. But there is not a particle more of time that I can spend on this article. Murray Hill. End of section 6. Section 7 of The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 7. Apotheosis, by Keith Preston. I often sigh and wonder whether some day they'll bind me in limp leather when i am limp enough no doubt in leather they will lay me out end of section seven